Um, we're going to be talking about the um, Reconstruction Era. Professor, historian, and the scholar Dr. Greg Carr will discuss the complex history of this country, which is rarely represented in today's curricula. The Reconstruction Era laid many of the foundations of what we know to be the United States of America, but the masses who actually built this country still go underrepresented. What else do we know about Andrew Johnson? Johnson is in, in, in some ways like, I don't know, LBJ. I hate to make that comparison. His elevation to the national ticket is as much about, he, they need those votes. But Andrew Johnson was an unreconstructed Southerner who stayed with the Union. He's born in North Carolina, but he lived in Tennessee. In fact, he came back to Congress after they impeached him and failed by one vote of putting him out. He came back to this set town as a senator and served in the United States Senate after he was the president. But Johnson, from Tennessee by that time, is still in the Union. So yeah, Johnson was not supposed to be president. Lincoln gets killed, Johnson's in, and so the hope is, well maybe because he was with us and he has disdain for the planter class, because he was kind of poor while he was a tailor, he might be tough on the South. No such luck. 1865 and 1866, Johnson is in the paint, rejecting every volley from the Congress. Get that week. <laughs> there will be no legislation that's going to impose, overly impose these undue burdens on the South. I'm gonna let them back in, I can, with very little conditions. And while he's doing that, the Southern states start passing laws restricting the rights of black people. Anybody know the names of those laws, what they were known as? Black exactly. So a lot of times in school, Young people will get black holes if they hear about it all. Oh, confused with Jim Crow. Confused. Neither of those really has much to do with Reconstruction because the Congress will come in after Johnson has really showed out and push him aside. In fact, and Jim Crow comes after Reconstruction as a direct consequence of the failure of Reconstruction. They override Johnson's vetoes in 1866. But while they're overriding his vetoes, two things. Number one, Johnson is getting more and more loose with his talk. He does a national tour for the midterm elections where he tries to go out and recruit people to his way of thinking and it ends up being more disastrous for him. Now this is how politics works, right? We're talking about federal reconstruction. Who does he have with him on the tour that he goes around the country trying to get whip up people for his position? Ulysses S. Grant. Why is Grant with Johnson? And we know Grant's politics are not Johnson's politics. Why do y'all think? He's the winning general. So he's following orders in part. It's also politics. He uses Grant because one of the laws they pass and then override his veto is a law that says you can't make cabinet appointments and then get rid of them without our consent, without Congress's consent. This is the beginning of what they're going to call radical reconstruction. They can't trust Johnson. Now imagine that. you got a secretary in your cabinet you want to get rid of, and Congress passed a law over your veto that says you can't get rid of one once you appoint them without our consent. Y'all think that's legal? Therein lies the arbitrary of law. Can you enforce it? In fact, let me skip forward for 30 seconds before I go back. 1923, Giles versus Alabama. By then, Reconstruction is over. Oliver Wendell Holmes, whose father was in the Civil War, he got Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. They love him, he's on Supreme Court. The Oliver Wendell Holmes says, in Alabama, you can't prevent these black men from voting. And yet, he says, in Giles versus Alabama, there's no need for us to go ahead and articulate that as a constitutional fact, because even if we articulate it, we don't have an army, and ultimately, the power of the law only extends as far as its enforceability. So Johnson is being checked by Congress and they tell him he can't do it. So he tries to suspend his Secretary of War, Stanton, who was with Lincoln because they don't trust him. Congress is like, no. Nah. And then who he put in? Grant. Grant becomes Secretary of War for a minute. And then Congress tells Grant, dude, you're breaking the law. So Grant demurs. He, he says, okay, I'm going to pull back. Then Johnson fires the Secretary of War, and by then he's done so many other things. Uh, he's vetoed the Reconstruction Acts, which are held by the Supreme Court to be constitutional. In fact, one of the Reconstruction Acts that he overrides, that he, that he vetoes, that they override, he vetoed that act on March the 2nd, 1867. Why is that date important? H.U. Oh. Let's do it again. H.U. Do you know? <laughs> that on March the 2nd, 1867, Andrew Johnson, perhaps drunk, signed the charter for Howard University, because it was in a stack of papers, maybe he didn't know what he was signing. <laughs> and on that same day, he vetoed the Reconstruction Act, <laughs> checking his power. But the thing about Howard was, it wasn't a school for black people. Right. It was a school that did not discriminate by race. This is the spirit of Reconstruction. 
you know, American Jesus Abraham Lincoln, you know, the same day he signs the uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, I believe it's the same day, y'all can check it, but I think he also between signed the death warrant for Little Crow and them, yeah. Fort Schnelling, who I, which I made them take me to when I went to Minneapolis, I said, I gotta go to Fort Schnelling, why? Because this is where Little Crow and them were, and they killed out of Lakota, and this is also the place that Dre and Harriet Scott were, with that dude who had them, in this fort in the upper Mississippi Valley, because you know, Minnesota is also the Mississippi. So yes, Lincoln, Gone. Johnson signs the charter for Howard. Johnson then vetoes the, the, uh, the Reconstruction Act. He tries to fire Stanton, and they override that. They say, you know what? That's it. This guy got to go. That's when they impeached him. And by one vote, Senate, he survived. Grant declares, Grant wins the election, and Grant comes into office. That's 1868. While they're getting their feet up under them fighting Johnson in 1867, they also passed the law declaring that black men can vote in the District of Columbia. So they, get, they extend suffering, right? Because remember, Lincoln is toying with the idea of emancipation, but it's going to be partial, it's going to be total, or it's going to be compensated. So while Johnson is in, the South is kind of like, well, that becomes probably the single element of Reconstruction that resonated, and that was not an urban legend. But it was Lincoln in the paint that time who said, nah, get that out of here. <laughs> we can't give them that because some of the Republicans in Congress decided, no, impose our will on the South. They lost the war. They left the federal polity, divide the land up, and give it to the people. That was the lost promise. People say, well, this is not history that's been told. No, it's been told. And one of the blessings of teaching for change and sin and is they're going to link you to those texts that have been here for some of them 40, 50 years, or in, 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 in Du Bois' case, since 1935. The contemporaries during Reconstruction also wrote it, because all that stuff is about people who were there. And it isn't all men. I read what Francis Ellen Watkins Harper is right now. You know, out of Baltimore, lived in Philly, school teacher. She's laying it down. And then when she writes that poem, Bury Me in a Free Land, come on. This is Reconstruction. I'm all for intersectionality. And I remember when, uh, when uh, Ken Crenshaw wrote that article. I was in law school. I this is powerful. But unfortunately, I had also read a lot of other stuff by then, so I realized it wasn't a new discussion. Well, it's the journal truth and ain't our woman wife because Elizabeth King Stanton and Susan B. Anthony Hall, oh, you won't get a devote the sample before you give it to your wives and daughters. The church said, oh, ain't our woman right? Let's be clear. The battle over the 15th Amendment, that reconstruction argument, is gender shot all through there, but that's as intersectional as it's ever been in American history. And that's for people who felt the whip. So this is not a bunch of us who ain't felt the whip. I know we've suffered, but compared to that, they were right at the heat. Imagine what those debates look like. Imagine Sojourner Truth in that room with nobody else but her. She thought, like, nah, this, this, this train got to slow. But if you read the history when it's divided out by race, class, and gender, and then put back together as if anybody lives those things separately. So these new constitutions are written, these state constitutions, do you think they were good or bad? On, 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 on as a whole, better or worse? Not yet, that comes Jim Crow. They're better, because who's in control? The Republicans, right? They've broken Andrew Johnson's back. They got the general in as the president. They got the South under military divisions, and you can't come back into the Union until not only you gotta swear local loyalty, loyalty, you gotta let these people vote, right? This is before the 15th Amendment. But they put laws in place to protect these black people. If you go look at the Constitution of Mississippi from 1868 and look at the Constitution of Mississippi now, that's an exercise that'll make y'all laugh and we open tears at the same time. How is the Constitution of 1868 more progressive? Because that was a foreign country in the mind of some of those congressmen and senators. Johnson, you're gonna let them back in and you're gonna let them keep their land? You gave them their land? Oh, you know what? Well, okay, fine, we gotta put some rules in place. Oh, you're gonna veto it? Okay. Oh, you're gonna fire the guy anyway? Guy. But you know what? Leave him alone. Why? Because he done going around the country talking crazy. He's going to lose the next election. Who we won? Grant. Grant will win. Grant swept the place. And when he was reelected, guess who put him in? The votes of black men around the country. That was his margin of victory. And that's not anything I would touch. At the 20th anniversary of the Civil War Museum, we had the best exposition of that. Somebody went down through the districts, went through the region, said, this is how black people put Grant in. If we talk now and say, your vote matters? You say, my vote doesn't matter. Go back and read Reconstruction. But now by 1869, we're past the major year. Probably, has anybody heard the phrase radical Reconstruction? Okay, there's no such thing. There's congressional Reconstruction. There's military Reconstruction. But the most radical people in the Congress couldn't get what they wanted, then as now. They wanted to divide the, the, the land up and give it to the Africans. They wanted to give it to the, that didn't get passed. So we say re, radical reconstruction, yeah it was radical compared to the alternative, but it wasn't radical the way it could have been. Because in 1868 when they rewrite those constitutions, that's 
when Hiram Rebels comes here from Mississippi. Blanche Kelso Bruce. These are two senators from Mississippi. One of them dudes had the seat that was held by Jefferson Davis. Try mm -hmm. flipping a seat like that today. W.B. Du Bois and Battery Instruction in America says in the South, public education was a Negro idea. Amen. They didn't say blacks only go to school. Or as y'all's uh, comrade Dave Dennis said at the funeral of James Cheney, when he said, we're going to rule over them like they ruled over us. That was the fear. But even when he said it, he didn't do it. Everybody gets to come. That's the promise of Reconstruction. So, so the, the concept of Reconstruction is, really, is a military term. We defeated you. Now we're going to impose the rest of our will, the Marshall Plan in Europe. Of course, the challenge is this is domestic. Ken Burns does this thing. This, any of y'all seen his documentary, Civil War? I love Ken Burns. I love him. I have a visceral disconnect with his philosophy of history. But I love Ken Burns because he is a magician and wiping away our necessity to study. When you hear, and you get in the close up and the withdrawal on the still, and you see Richmond bombed to hell, and then Shelby Foote comes in, of course, they were doing it because they thought they were What are you doing, Ken Burns? Ken Burns is invested in America as an idea. I respect that. And so when he talks about reconstruction, he's talking about the way you articulated it. We're going to build something better and we're going to move collectively. No, this was a war. You lost. And the radical problem, they wipe it off the face of the earth. This is our chance. We brought y'all here. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Either way, we can't kill all of y'all. It's three million, some of y'all. Divide the land up. Give it to them. That's reconstruction. Ain't that what they did in Iraq? And then, of course, finally, when the 14th Amendment is passed, in the half century after the 14th Amendment is passed, once they eviscerated, when they decided the civil rights cases in 1883, which is basically saying the 14th Amendment cannot impose on the states, you have state action that has to be considered and the federal government can't overreach. The slaughterhouse cases in Louisiana, where they shut down these white slaughterhouse guys who don't want, to, who, who the government has decided they're gonna consolidate the power of the, of the uh, butchers. And the individual butchers are like, I have the right to contract. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 and the 13th Amendment, this is a badge of inferiority. Can you interpret the 13th Amendment to say that this, this is involuntary servitude, I'm a butcher and I can't get a contract because you decided? The Supreme Court then says in the slaughterhouse cases, well, can't really interfere with state action. So they, they're cutting back, but who begins to take advantage of the 14th Amendment? To quote Mitt Romney, corporations are people, my friend. The railroad companies, so they become legal people. These same railroad companies are also giving money to a lot of people in grants administration. Finally, the narrative that Ken Burns likes to push and others like to push that there's something called America with these ideas, that's a bold-faced lie. This America, America is what we decide it's gonna be. And so that's what leads to the notion that reconstruction is something that is aspiring to something that existed in the past that we're going to strengthen. No, this is a zero-sum power game. And if you want to mean something, let's make up the definition right now. Yes. And reconstruction is you lost, now wipe it away, and let's build something. And I still think that's what it has to be. Yeah. Jesse Jackson, you say, you know, and I'm sure he wasn't the only one to say it, but it's like, you know, deal us in or cut it out. That's really almost, you can, you can kind of summarize reconstruction in that, and deal us in or cut us out. And when you deal us in, you get public education. When you deal us in, you get this notion of enforcement of rights. But when you cut us out, you get the type of white supremacy that can't be sustained, and it's going to collapse. Back in 2010, the New York Historical Society had an exhibition on revolutions. So I went up there to see it, and they had a copy of the Haitian Constitution, the one that was drafted by the Haitians, you know, and then Toussaint gets sold out and Desalines comes in, you know, shout out to Brooklyn now, they got a street name for Desalines, even though city council was some controversy about that, but they write this thing, so everybody in Haiti is like politically black. Blackness becomes like a legal kind of thing. Forget the phenotype, we're going to make everybody equal, but to make everybody equal, we're not going to trend to the whiteness. We're going to use black as the normative assumption. But if you don't want to be black, you can leave. But if you're going to stay here, you're going to be black. This whole notion of it. So they had the Haitian Constitution, and they had the 13th Amendment, the one that Lincoln saw and put his name on. This is the preliminary draft amendment before he gets killed down the street in April, right, 65. And, you know, Lincoln, through his tortured knights of the soul, you know, do we free these Negroes and send them to Nicaragua or Haiti something? Okay, something in Haiti, should we come back over here with guns? But uh, do we, I mean, what do we do? You know, he done, he done already battled back and forth with uh, with Freddie Douglas and the Martin Delaney. It's like, I don't want nothing except give me the guns and I can get the dudes, which is why he might have got the commission 
as the first commission major in the United States military, a thing that Douglas kind of bristled at, because Douglas, he should have given it to me, but I think in Lincoln's mind, maybe, or at least to read the scholarship on it, maybe in Lincoln's mind, Martin Delaney doesn't care about me, you, or anybody else. He's trying to get black people free, and I need to win this war. So, I mean, Lincoln is, you know, he's going through his permutations, and he's on his way to his Gethsemane, and then I guess his Calvary. You know, I gave a talk to the National Archive one time called Abraham Lincoln, American Jesus. Because it's like, no, really, because the George Washington, the father, clearly Abraham Lincoln is the Jesus, he's the son, which might make Martin Luther King the Holy Ghost. But America needs, America needs its civic religion. It need, and, and Abraham Lincoln is the above reproach, elevated, sacrificial lamb that submits the whole proposition. Forget Reconstruction and Grant and James Garfield, who had he lived, might have been more interesting than Lincoln. You know, this abolitionist, anti-slavery congressman from Ohio who gets a little bit kind of lukewarm, a little bit later, then he runs president, wins the presidency, and he gets killed. But Lincoln signed this piece of paper they had at the New York Historical Society. I want to go, I want to go up here and see this, because when you get a chance to see something, you don't get a chance to see much. Go see it, right? So I'm going through the revolutions exhibit, and then downstairs, they have the 13th Amendment, except you don't know in the exhibit upstairs on revolutions that the 13th Amendment is down there. It just so happened they were on display at the same time. So I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, this is a piece of paper, here's a case, and here I am looking at it. I am looking at a piece of paper that was arguing over whether I was a human being or not. And I was upstairs with a constitution that assumed my humanity in a country that was much more advanced than the one I'm in, one that Lincoln didn't recognize until 1863, Haiti. It was much better advanced on race than this, and, but, and yet in the narrative, this is the thing I'm supposed to be happy about. 